Okay, so in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to look at our same simulated data that we've been working with, but now we're going to look at outliers. And so what I've done is I've added one value, one new value to the bottom that is going to be an outlier. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to identify it in a couple of different ways. So the first thing that we're going to do is we are going to uh, create a graph of our data. So get a plot. And again, we're going to adjust our axes a little bit. So just to spread out our graph and let it fill the screen a little bit better. We're going to add our axis titles. And we're going to add our trend line. And for right now, I'm just going to put the line on the graph. We're not going to worry about other attributes for the moment. Now, an outlier in regression is not defined as a value that is necessarily well outside the range in any one particular direction. Instead, it's defined as its distance from the line, the regression line, the line of best fit. Now, um, in this case, our outlier value is uh, originally the value of the age was 25 and the value of the amount spent was about $80. Now, both of these values are within the range of both X and Y. Um, our ages go from like 17 or 18, I guess this says 19, all the way up to 69. That's the range of our ages in our data. So 25 is definitely inside that range. And the Y values go from 36 and change all the way up to 110 and change. And 80 is definitely in that range. So individually, uh, this is not an outlier in either X or Y, but it is an outlier in the relationship. Um, you can see that this point is much further away from our regression line than any other point on the line and any other point in our data set, that's an indication of an outlier. It's this distance from the line that is the problem. So what we can do is we can identify that outlier. So we can see it visually. We can also see it by doing calculations on our residuals. Now, rather than do all of the calculations by hand, I'm gonna use the data analysis tool pack and have it calculate my residuals for me. Labels, we're not gonna worry about the confidence intervals, the output range. I definitely don't want all the way down there, I want here. Uh, I am going to calculate the residuals and I'm going to calculate the residual plots because that's a useful way of us looking at it. Uh, now, in the, if we calculate the normal probability plots, we'll also be able to see um, how that it, it's going to look like it's far away from our straight line. Um, and you can calculate that, but I'm not going to do that here because it's going to kind of get away, in the way of working with my residuals. Um, just be based on where they place that data. So now I'm gonna go ahead and hit okay. And I get my output and I'm gonna spread it out a little bit. Now, the thing about the, um, and again, I'm going to increase this size just so we can see it a little bit. Um, on the residual output, you can also identify the outlier visually because it is going to be far away from the rest of the data. So you can see 
all of the other residuals are down here. And then we have one value that is way up here. This is again, a sign of an outlier. Um, so we can identify it in that sense. And if, in fact, if we click on it um, or hover over it, it can actually tell us the actual value, the point, the values that age 25 and the residual is 30.8. Whereas some of our other higher values our higher residuals are going to be much smaller. Uh, that's in the 4.5 range. This one is in the negative eight range. So 30 is huge compared to the rest of these values. Now, residual uh, uh, errors like this, outliers like this can be particularly problematic in the sense that um, they can sometimes in affect the line, the regression line. They can be influential and they can pull the line away. Now, influential points uh, don't have to be outliers. They can fall on the line and still tend to be influential. Um, but influential, but outliers can be influential points. And so this is something that we have to worry about. The smaller our data set is, the more concerned we have to be with an outlier. When we get really, really big data sets, uh, you expect there to be outliers, just unusual values happen 5% of the time by definition. Uh, that's two standard deviations from the mean outside our 95% confidence interval. If you have 100, out, 100 observations, you should expect that you will just accidentally get you know, a couple of these outliers. Uh, may not always be five, uh, if you have a hundred inputs, but it'll be in that vicinity. Um, but you still, even in that circumstance, you would want to still be concerned about things that are extreme outliers because again, they can still affect. But as the data gets, that gets larger, you would expect that these things would be more and more. When your data set is small, they have a much more outsized influence. And so it's much more common to remove them in small data sets. We have only 32 observations here. If we remove one of them, we are losing some data, but we might get a better estimate of the true population because it's less able to withstand, um, it's less able to withstand the um, influence of a single extreme outlier. Now, the best way to calculate whether or not you have outliers, I mean, there, there's not uh, sort of only one method. There's quite a few of them. One of those methods is to use your standard error estimate and essentially to calculate um, the size of the residual uh, if you have any that are more than twice the size of your standard error. So the absolute value is more than twice the standard error, then um, that would be considered an outlier. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna construct a little formula. So this is gonna sort of be a normal outlier, and then we can construct a graph uh, table for the extreme outliers. Extreme outliers, um, one way of calculating these is to think of them as being outside three standard deviations from the mean, whereas you might think of a typical outlier as being more than two standard deviations from the mean, so what we're going to do is we're going to make a little if statement. If the absolute value of this number, the residual, is greater than two times the standard error, and I am going to put a dollar sign on this. Then give me a one that identifies it as an outlier, and otherwise give me a zero. So this value is less than the standard error, so it's obviously not an outlier. And then if we highlight all the way down, what we see is that in our column, we have all zeros except for this one outlier, our residual error of 30. Now we can do basically the same thing for the extreme outliers, I'm gonna copy this formula. And then the one thing that I'm gonna change is that the multiplier is gonna go from two to three. Three standard deviations, remember, um, using the empirical rule gives us 0.3 chance of something happening. And so that, that's a very 
unlikely event unless you have a lot of data. And if you get something that is more than three times your standard error, you absolutely need to think about, especially with small data sets, removing it. And this is an extreme outlier. So that's, that's one way of thinking of it in terms of standard deviations. You can do similar, calc similar calculations using IQR. Um, you can also make a box plot of your residuals. So box plots and histograms work really well for visualizing uh, what's going on. Um, we don't really have a lot of data for a histogram. Um, but you can see just even on the preview for our histogram, you've got all the residuals out here and you've got one stray value way out there. Um, but instead, I just wanna do a box and whisker because the box and whisker is going to explicitly calculate the extreme outliers, the outliers and extreme outliers automatically. And we can see right here, again, it's being flagged very clearly. Most of the data is in here. These upper and lower fences are calculated. Um, there, the lower fence, there's no values below the lower fence. So this is just the minimum value. But there is an upper fence. Remember, it's 1.5 times the IQR. And if we, if we hover over it, we can see that it's pointing at that residual of 30. This is a long way away from that upper fence. So that's telling us that this is not only an outlier, but this is an, an extreme outlier. And again, we could do the same calculation just as we did with the, the standard errors. We can calculate the IQR, our first quartile and our third quartile, take the difference. The, that's our IQR. And then 1.5 times that um, is how far away we need to be from the third quartile to calculate. Um, it's a little bit it's a little bit trickier um, to do that calculation, but it can definitely be done. And uh, again, you can do the same sort of construction with an if statement to just flag these are the ones that are your out, potential outliers. But the box plot does that calculation all in, in, internally. And so you can see visually which one it is. And then you can work backwards. This is the value of the residual is 30. You can look at your residual data and find the value that's equal to 30. And that will point you at the observation number and so forth. So again, there's lots of different ways to identify these outliers. Uh, and you can, any of them, are, are good, but again, the, the, the idea here is that if you have a small data set, you might want to remove them. If you have a large data set, then you're going to get them. And then it's a question of how extreme is it? Generally, the threshold goes up the bigger that the data set is. You generally don't wanna throw away data. Um, and if it's, if it's a value that you expect to have just because of the quantity of your data, then uh, you don't necessarily need to remove them. But small data sets, big outliers can be a problem. So what I'm gonna do, just so that we've, we, we can look at it, you should always do a test basically to determine if it's gonna make a difference because sometimes outliers don't affect the data that much. So I'm gonna recalculate my regression. And I'm just gonna put it over here. Um, And I'm just gonna, I know that that is the last value in the data set. So I'm just gonna remove the last value in both of these columns. And then I am going to redo my output just so that we can compare what happens to my data when I remove this one point. And I will also just note uh, as good practice, 
if you are removing data, in this case, it's not necessarily the last one, maybe you have to delete it from somewhere in the middle. Um, what I would suggest is that um, you copy the data to another sheet and then remove it from the copy so that you have the original data in case you need to reconstruct it again. So now let's do some comparisons with what we had before and what we have now. So in the first example, our standard error with the outlier included was 6.5. With, with that outlier not included, it's now down to 2.97. So that it has a big impact on the amount of variability we're explaining. Our correlation value went from 0.94 with the outlier to 0.98989 without the outlier. So that had, a, again, a fairly significant noticeable difference on the correlation value. Let's look at our slope and intercept values. Our intercept value with the outlier included was 16.9, and the intercept without it was 11.8. And if we look at the slope value, the prediction was 1.29, and now it is 1.38. And we know this, this is data constructed from the same equation that I've been using, where the slope is actually 1.4. So this is good. And in fact, if we go back to the error, the standard errors for each of these coefficients, um, the intercept standard error is 3.6. Here it's 1.7, it's half basically. So much less variability in the intercept. And if we look at the standard error for the slope, 0.078 versus 0.036. So again, it's about half the size. This is in fact more than half smaller. So these, these numbers are all related to each other. So when you take that, that outlier out, that extreme outlier out, then your estimates are actually going to be, they're going to be better. Uh, again, assuming that that's an unusual value. And you can see that our residual graph it doesn't have that extreme outlier anymore. It's all just this data down here. There isn't this big gap at the top because there's no outlier at Cody anymore. Now, related to outliers is, is this idea of influential points. Um, now, we could argue that there was some influence on the slope and the intercept, and that's always going to be a little bit true um, depending on the location and the size of your outlier. But um, you can also have influential points which are not, um, strictly speaking, outliers as far as the regression line goes. So what I wanna look at very briefly is what happens if, to our graphs, if we change this from an outlier that's inside our X range to something that follows the trend, but nonetheless is not actually on, uh, sort of in the range of the rest of our data. So an age that is well outside the range of our original inputs from 18 to 75 or so is going to be, let's say 116. That is still in the legal, the sort of actual age range of people who are still alive today. Um, it's, but it's a long way away from most of the rest of this. And again, if we don't change the Y value, then this is, an in, this is um, a big influence here. But I want to, before we, we, we look at influential points that are also outliers, um, I want to actually put something that's sort of more along the, the original line of our data and let's say maybe this is like 170. Okay, so that's good. Now, in order to compare, um, we could have just uh, customer age and amount spent plotted without this one point. And so I'm gonna make a new graph just so we have a point of comparison. And I'm not gonna worry about the labels since this is literally the same graph. I am going to 
try to match the axes values though. Um, we want these on the same scale. So I'll make this 135. Normally I wouldn't do this, but I'm trying to match these. Uh, and I set this bottom one to be 30 and we need the top one to be 190. Okay, so now we have these things where we can compare them. This is the plot of the data without this last point, and this is the plot of the data with it. And so you can see that if I add the trend line, the trend line on both of these graphs is going to be very similar. And in fact, I'll put our trend line and so forth on both graphs. so that we can compare them. Now, 0 0 0.9799, 0 0.9881, these are very high, very similar, our squared values are intercept here is 11.8 and here it's 12.3 that did not make a lot of difference um 1.39 1.369 versus 1.382 though they're very similar slope values so even though this point is a long way from the data it is not um doing a lot in terms of changing the relationship of the slope because it's actually in line with the trend. Now, where this, this influential point in outlier business becomes sort of a problem is where it is both a long way away from the rest of the data in terms of both X and Y, but then, or at least in either X or Y, but then it is also an outlier. Uh, if it's also uh, doing something atypical. So if I change this amount spent back to something like 80, and then we can do our comparison again, this point is a long way away from the rest of the data in X, but look what it did to our slope and our R squared value and our intercept. It just totally whacked it out. So our instead of having a 0.98, R squared value, our R squared value has dropped to 0 0.6. Um, our slope has dropped from 1.38 to 0.82. And our intercept has gone from 11.8 to 34.9. This is a problem value. It is, it is not only an outlier in the sense that it is a long way away from the line. It's also an influential point because it is dragging that slope. It essentially think of it like torque, right? As you open the door, it's easier to open the door from the outside than it is from the inside of the where your where the hinge is. And that's essentially what's happening here because this is a long way from the rest of the data. Any change in this line is going to have a much bigger impact on this point out here because it's so much further away from the data than these other values which are all closer together. Um, and so you can imagine this as a hinge, the further away it is, the more influence it's going to have. And so this is the kind of point where even if you have a lot of data, if it's a long way away from the rest of the data and it has a big uh, outlier status, it is going to affect your line. This is where you almost certainly are going to have to think about removing the point. Whereas when it's more online, with the rest of our data and it just kind of it you know you draw the regression line where is your estimate this is going to be it's still going to have some influence but because it's following the trend then it's not going to actually affect the statistics for your line and you can keep them more or less in place um the example where the point was down here that might be an indication that the trend doesn't continue Maybe there's some kind of nonlinearity in the data. 
And so that's going to be a potentially problematic value and you're going to want to remove it. So the outliers and influential points, influential points don't have to be outliers um, and they don't necessarily have to be a problem, but you do have to watch out for when your outliers are in the middle of the data, they may not have too big an effect unless you have a little, only a small amount of data. But when they're on the outside, they're gonna have a much bigger influence. And so then you're gonna to need to be much more concerned about what's happening in terms of uh, whether or not you remove that data point, sometimes even when you have a lot of data. 